Hey, right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, so for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'm just uh, not to repeat myself, but I just want to congratulate everybody for finding your way to uh, what we think is really the most important uh, technological innovation, uh, source of technological innovation, scientific innovation, uh, basically human innovation happening in the world today, and prob most likely in our lifetime. So you're in the right place, and however you found your way here, uh, I commend you for doing that. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is, as uh, William mentioned, is kind of a broad overview of uh, artificial intelligence, what it means, where uh, it kind of fell short in the past, and why it's uh, proving so successful now. Uh, and also a little, just a little conceptual overview of uh, where these deep learning and artificial neural networks comes from. Uh, so we're at the Center for Complex Systems and Brain Sciences. I have, uh, my, my academic background is really in computational neuroscience and experimental psychology. And I come to deep learning by way of uh, trying to understand the brain. What happened in uh, very recent history, about 2012, 2013, is that a particular class of models, the artificial neural networks, which are directly uh, modeled on the brain, they're directly inspired by the brain, uh, started to solve real world problems. And this inspired me and I think many others to really take a much closer look and see uh, what the, the potential and the promise of these uh, models is. Turns out that they have enormous potential, enormous promise, and we have only yet begun to see uh, what this uh, new type of, this new kind of tool that we call deep learning now uh, has to offer. So here's, this is the opportunity for the line, right? You figure out the brain, but you can't figure out how the clicker works. Uh, <laughs> So that's not going to happen. So let me just do this. Or when we hit a point where it decides not to work. Well, it could be that the or it could be that the computers are just taken over and have decided they that we know too much. Uh, so here's some wonderful quotes from some of the uh, movers and shakers in the field. Perhaps you've heard of Andrew Ng. He's probably the single most uh, person most responsible for promulgating the uh, the educational on the educational side. Uh, what uh, deep learning is about. Uh, he had a, a very popular Coursera series um, that maybe it's a little dated now that they uh, I think they've uh, kind of updated uh, the, the education materials. Uh, Andrew Ng said, is famous for saying, artificial intelligence is the new electricity. And what I think he means by that is obviously it's, it's first of all, it's a big breakthrough. Second of all, uh, it's going to, it is starting to be everywhere and it's going to be everywhere. As we're fond of saying, if you were to, you know, ask a question, uh, now, like, what you know, what businesses rely on uh, electricity right now? Which businesses need electricity and which businesses don't? Right? It's kind of a stupid question. Every single business, every single industry, every single, you know, aspect of civilization, you, you have to have the lights turn on. You have to be able to turn on your computer, right? With which, what kind of business doesn't require computing? Well, in, in not too long, uh, it, it's going to be the same thing for deep learning. Artificial intelligence is going to penetrate pretty much every aspect of uh, if industry and science and technology. And Peter Diamandis said, we have no idea how fast things are changing. So this is the moment to both be excited and to panic, which is something we uh, kind of revel in here at a, in the MPCR lab. We're in a, a, kind of in a state of consistent uh, panicked excitement because things are moving very, very quickly. You know, the, 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 there's this kind of convergence of uh, technological breakthrough and communication breakthrough. There's there's tools now for people to be able to communicate their ideas and communicate their code. Stuff we're going to be doing today, this collaboratory that you're going to be using, this is a brand new product put out by Google that allows pretty much anybody to turn on your computer anywhere and start working in deep learning, right? So this democratizes this this uh, these tools in a way that was just un totally impossible until recently, right? Google actually shares a, a little chunk of a GPU with you. And these GPUs are these big, powerful, you know, these powerful, uh, graphical processing units that are able to do this parallel computing that allows this stuff to happen. You could, you'd have to go and buy a big gaming GPU and you'd have to do all these installs and it was just really, a, trust me, we spent the past, you know, few years setting up our lab. It's, it's uh, you know, it was a hurdle and now all of a sudden it's much easier to do. So these things are happening very, very quickly. And so again, you're in the right place uh, at the right time. So just a very broad overview, artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. What are these uh, various term, terms that we use? So artificial intelligence is the most broad general idea, uh, which is basically input in some sort of input, some sort of uh, typically a digital kind of input that goes into a, a machine. And then the machine has to make a decision, do something, you know, move your checkers around or steer your car or decide whether to invest in a certain stock or not, right? The whole idea is basically that a computer is making some sort of complex decision. This idea 
is, is an old one, since at least 1950s, uh, well, at least in, in science fiction long before that. Um, but at the, at, by the dawn of the 50s, there were the transistor, the digital transistor uh, was invented in Bell Labs, and suddenly you could build computers that could do really complicated stuff at a reasonably small scale. And so there were checkers playing computers uh, pretty early on. Uh, Claude Shannon actually uh, designed, uh, he was one of the, he's the founder of information theory, designed a, a chess playing computer, although he didn't build it. Uh, but these were built fairly since people, so artificial intelligence, the idea of, of doing, uh, having machines do intelligent stuff was around, has been around for some time. Uh, machine learning was also actually, this isn't really quite accurate. It's not that machine learning started here. Claude Shannon, uh, I'm going to show you in one minute. Um, he, he built a, a machine learning robot, believe it or not, way back uh, in the 40s. And, um, but machine learning really started to flourish as this, as this indicates. So machine learning is, is a little bit different. It's instead of a, 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 where you program the computer exactly what to do with each input. Instead, there's some sort of algorithm that self updates. And obviously we're going to talk about this in some more detail, but this is where it really started to come into its own. There were various uh, machine learning tools that started to show success in some domains. And then uh, what, what happened during this time was through these various sort of bust and boom cycles. Uh, William mentioned the AI winters. Um, and you know, people, there was a lot of excitement. You know, I talk about panicked excitement. There was a lot of excitement here. So a lot of excitement throughout here. People thought, well, very soon, machines are gonna be doing all the kinds of things that humans do. And you know, often uh, what would happen is people get all excited. And then it didn't quite turn out to be that way. And then they get excited again. Um, and so there were these, there was these cycles. Um, so we're at a different cycle now where I think uh, it's the, uh, the debate has been settled. So we're now in the so early two, 2010s. Uh, it's really, there was specific dates, 2012, 2013. There was a big breakthrough where this deep learning arri arri uh, arrived, which was artificial neural networks, which again had been around for a long time, started to really work. And um, we'll talk a little bit about why they started to work. But the point was that these simulations of the brain at a large scale could start to solve what we call real world problems. So not assembly line where everything's perfectly uh, fixed or a very small particular kind of type of data set like say uh, written letters, uh, the, you know, the uh, handwritten letters, which uh, we have some members here from NIST for this a very famous data set. So some of these problems had been successfully approached with uh, these kinds of approaches before, but all of a sudden now you had real world. We're talking about road signs, for example, road signs in the wild, right? We can think of these natural images in the wild, uh, which present a very specific and very difficult problem started to fall. These problems, these, these, uh, uh, these kinds of problems start to be solved. Um, so what we have here is uh, sort of a, a very quick graph. I'm not gonna go through all the details of these AI winters. Uh, so there's a lot of funding, a lot of excitement, and they're like, oh, it doesn't really work. But wait a second, what if we try this, right? What if we try parallel distributed processing? What's that? Well, it's another name for artificial neural networks. Um, and that was a big idea, but then, no, nah, it doesn't quite work. It only solves what people call toy problems. I like to say that in, when I was in graduate school, I spent many hours sitting in seminars, people telling me that artificial neural networks can't work because of this, right? Almost like mathematically proving that they're just not actually gonna do the real world problems. And then what we see again is this resurgence. Um, and I, I like, you know, I, you can, I, I'd put money on it that we're not gonna see a serious kind of AI winter uh, for a long time. Uh, where the, the, the idea that we're not gonna be able to solve real world problems is already, as I said, been settled. So there's all this dramatic progress in recent years. We see it all around us. Computer vision, speech recognition, autonomous control. We have self-driving cars. You can go to the Tesla uh, store and you can buy yourself a car that has uh, some degree of self-driving capabilities, you can talk to your phone, right? This, if, if, you're young, if you're too young to realize, like my kids, they think that's just no big deal. You take out your phone and it, you talk to it and it understands. Now, they know it, it doesn't understand that much. It's not true general, artificial general intelligence. You can't have a very meaningful conversation with it. But what they don't realize is just the fact that it's able to make out the words, you know, just the speech to text, right? Uh, if you just want to send a text and you can just talk to your phone, the fact that it's able to successfully do that is a very big deal. Something that was pretty much, I would call it a largely unsolved problem. Uh, maybe 15 years ago, it was, it was not worth even trying to use it. It was just w worse than nothing. You may as well find a different solution. Hire yourself, uh, you know, an interpreter who you can talk to and then can type it in. Uh, so these things are, are working and they're working at, in some cases, 
better than human levels. So these dominoes are falling. Um, so we're seeing this across many industries. The computer vision is turning out to be very important in the case of uh, medical diagnosis. I like to tell my students, if you're thinking about medical school, you might not want to entertain radiology. Uh, any job who's who's, where your primary, when your role is to stare at images and to do some classification on those images, you're up against some very, very big hitters. Uh, so, you know, DeepMind, Google's DeepMind uh, is, is getting all of the data from the National Health Services in England. They're crunching through enormous amounts of data, far, far more images than any radiologist could ever see in his or her lifetime, aggregating all that, learning things that human radiologists simply can't, can't know and can't see. So there's, there's some encouraging here. I wouldn't, maybe, maybe uh, you know, the, the softer pitch is that in some cases, what we see is human radiologists, uh, deep learning may not do as well, may, may make fewer errors, but it's the human plus the deep learning that really ends up uh, leading to a much better diagnostic rate. And radiologists make a lot of mistakes, turns out. Uh, you know, so we've known this for some time. Your doctor just doesn't necessarily share this with you. And so human plus deep learning, right? Well, maybe that's the future. Radiologists will have a particular role, but maybe it'll be in conjunction with, with the AI. Um, so Self-driving, right? So this is, if you want to really know, right? If you ever really want, really want to understand, uh, you know, what the utility of, of uh, any technology is, ask the actuaries, the ones who actually really, whose job depends on making the accurate prediction. And so these are basically, uh, these are projections in terms of how much auto insurance is going to cost, how much it's going to cost uh, to insure different cars based on whether they're going to have autonomous uh, self-driving capabilities or not. And so I think the trend is pretty clear. We don't need to do our statistics on this. Uh, it's much cheaper to insure cars with, with uh, self-driving capabilities. And that means that we're quickly going to head to the point, and I, I'm happy to say as, as a father of young children, where at a certain, if there's a certain cutoff where our certain kids who are alive now are probably never going to drive, uh, which is fine with me, right? <laughs> so that means uh, that this is going to become you know, sort of a leisure activity to, to drive, and it's not going to be a particularly safe leisure activity. So this is coming. It's here. That's why you guys, and of course you guys all know to some extent that this is happening. That's why you're, you're in this room today. So as I mentioned, there was, uh, there was these big breakthroughs, these kind of watershed moments uh, in 2012. This was the first time that uh, a AI beat out humans. So here's first place and here's second place, right? Humans came in second place in 2012 on this road sign, right? That's, people talk about the singularity. Well, this is at least within this confined uh, particular problem which again was uh, really largely, I was, I'm not gonna call it unsolved. There was some progress, but it was incremental progress. All of a sudden there was this dramatic progress where machines were doing better than humans at road sign detection. Um, and we have just really remarkable displays And this, you know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll burst into my office on any given day uh, and you know, share the, the latest crazy breakthrough. And so we have things like auto captioning. Uh, you know, so this is, uh, these are the results of an AI uh, producing some caption of this image. Two bears, two brown bears sitting on top of rocks, blue and yellow train traveling down train tracks. Um, again, it might be difficult for you to uh, understand, given your, if, depending on your age, just how ridiculously uh, out of sight this kind of thing was about 10 years ago. Uh, again, having you know, studied vision and, and computational vision in graduate school, people thought that this was a long way off, if perhaps never, and here it is, right? Well, here we have Basically, it almost looks like general intelligence in relation to describing images. So, tremendous amount of progress. Uh, and so, this is this thing called deep learning, um, which is these large-scale artificial neural networks, simulations of the brain that uh, basically uh, have many, many uh, artificial neurons. And this is a sort of trend line, Google trend. Uh, if you just search for deep learning and you look at the Google trend, you can see that this thing's really heating up. Uh, these things are becoming very important. If you look at Google's own website in terms of uh, which sectors within their company they are handing over to artificial intelligence, not that long, I think it was about 2015, they basically turned their search, which is you know, their core product, over to uh, their unit, which was Google Brain. Uh, so it was at one point, it was just this little one guy working in a corner uh, and you know, every once in a while saying, hey, check out this cool thing. And then uh, at some point they were like, you know what? Let's give this. Uh, uh, let's let's shift the entire operation over uh, to this to the, to, a, to the AI. So machine learning is not new. 
the whole concept of, of having machines uh, learn stuff. I'm going to skip through here. But here's Claude Shannon. I was really excited to know that there was a video of Claude Shannon. I had no idea. <laughs> to me, he always was just the entropy and uh, you know information measure. I didn't actually realize you could see the guy. Uh, so here he is demonstrating. There you go. So there's Claude Shannon uh, showing uh, an actual uh, machine learning technique. Now, the mouse, there's no brain in there. So actually, it's sort of under the hood. Uh, he was being very clever, recognizing that, you know, well, who wants to know about mice learning mazes? Right, neuroscientists, right? So in behavioral and experimental psychology, he basically was coming along with the idea that this, this is a new way of doing the science of psychology, trying to understand the brain. Um, and in some ways, uh, this kind of initiative kind of got buried. Uh, people, to a large extent, forgot about the fact that a lot of the early days of computer science were really very much directly inspired by the brain. And uh, you know, part of my kind of uh, academic mission is to, to say, well, we, we need to, once again, we need to take seriously uh, that the inspiration for neural networks is the brain. There's a lot more to be learned there. So this was, a, in some ways, a very simple version of machine learning, but it, uh, the idea was there. Uh, right from the beginning, right from the get-go, from the time the computers were created, the idea that computers could program themselves. And why, where would you get such a crazy idea? Well, of course, because that's how all biological organisms learn. They aren't programmed. Very little of our developmental experience consists of somebody instructing us directly, here's what you do, and certainly not going and actually directly changing the wiring in our brain. Instead, there has to be some method by which machines or, or brains can learn on their own based on their experience. And even uh, neural networks, as I mentioned, are not new. Uh, there's uh, the, the part of the uh, AI winters were based on the successes and, and failures of different versions of artificial neural networks. People recognized from early on uh, that the idea that uh, we can model the basic circuitry of the brain, so neurons connected via these changeable weights, and that Somehow, if you change the, if you if you uh, if you set the weights correctly, you should be able to produce pretty much any computational function. It was proved early on that these uh, kinds of uh, devices, that this this kind of model, could solve any computational problem. But in practical terms, that was a long way off. It's only recently that that's been able to to really take off with with deep learning. So why what's new? Why is this happening now? What's the big uh, insight? You know, it's not the case that artificial neural networks is a new idea. Deep learning, it's the catchphrase, it's almost probably very deliberate to use a new phrase for an old idea, right? These were called association nets, they were called uh, neural networks, they were called uh, par parallel distributed processing. So what's deep learning? Well, it's really the same idea, but on speed uh, with a lot of new capabilities. So what are these new capabilities? Well, we have hardware. Big hardware, uh, new, new hardware capabilities, particularly this graphical processing unit, right? Uh, so these are, uh, we, we can thank the gamers for uh, the success of deep learning because these, were, these uh, particular chips were designed to really quickly do the computation to produce high level graphics, right? We have to basically decide what's gonna be in each pixel on, a high, on an HD screen, that requires a lot of processing. Uh, in, in, you know, in real time when, during a video game. Well, it turns out those kinds of parallel computing capabilities are also really good for simulating the kinds of uh, math, the, for, for doing the kind of math that, uh, that artificial neural networks need to do. So we have hardware, we have data, so big influx of digital data. Uh, if you wanted to get uh, 10,000 pictures of cats and dogs uh, in, back in the 80s, well, you basically have you'd be on your own. You'd have to get out, you know, maybe rent, uh, go out, go to the, uh, you know, university um, imaging center, find the, the scanner, get online, and then find your go, go take, uh, you know, analog photographs and print them out, and then go start scanning, right? And so it was utterly impossible to get uh, anything like the kind of amount of data, you know. When we talked about MNIST, which was this, uh, this famous data set that's still so it's handwritten digits. It's still uh, very much in use. People are still using it because it's so heavily benchmarked. Uh, people have, you know, ten, probably tens of thousands of, of studies have been done. And that's because some, the, you know, the, the, the uh, 
organization of the, the, the government decided that it was worth their while to, to digitize all of these handwritten data, digits. Uh, but until recently, there just wasn't all this data available. And then there's, of course, there's algorithms. Let me get that out of here. Did I just stop the video? I hope not. Well, anyway, uh, so we have breakthroughs in how to build these kinds of artificial neural nets. There's, there, we're, we're not going to go into a, a great deal of, of technical detail, but there are, there are, there have been breakthroughs uh, in both in how to construct these things and, in particular, how to learn, how to set the weights. Right, the whole point is you got to set these weights. There's, there's some uh, very important breakthroughs. Uh, automatic differentiation, which allows you to basically uh, arbit take an arbitrary uh, model and learn and figure out how to change the weights. Uh, I'll save more of that for when uh, William presents. So uh, we have 110 years of Moore's law. The number of transistors on a chip doubles roughly every 18 months. It's held out uh, quite spectacularly. So this is obviously a uh, nonlinear uh, increase in uh, the amount of just the amount of computing power you can put into the same uh, same chip. Um, and you know it's gotten much cheaper. Right, so five megabytes would cost you $120,000 in 1956. So here they are loading it into an airplane that's been created, right? Uh, right, we, what are we, five megabytes, right? Wow, imagine, right? Right, what's, what's one digital photograph? Maybe 10 megabytes, right? How about a video, right, two gig? And you know, I, I, it, just recently, uh, it, I, we, we changed our, our phone plan or something, and um, you know, we had a certain gig limit, and one of my kids turned off their, uh, their uh, Wi-Fi, and I also I got a message, you know, like a day later, you know, hit your limit, right? So that's like like several gig in just a few, you know, just a couple of movies, and you're done, right? So we just trade in data in ridiculously quickly, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't have the same meaning it once did, and that's the price of storage of data. So now. Uh, this is probably outdated, right? 128 gigabytes for $99. Forget that, right? <laughs> you could uh, you could definitely do better. Uh, so don't don't uh, don't settle for that. Uh, so you know, literally by the week, these things uh, drop in price. Um, so this the GPU, as I mentioned. So it's a, a ridiculous. You know, the, the number of, of computations that this thing could do is just very difficult for us to to process. Uh, so nine trillion calculations per second. These are 1080s. This is the kind of GPUs that uh, if you visited the lab. Or if you haven't had a chance, you're going to go upstairs. Uh, these are, you know, off the shelf. This is, you can buy this now. Uh, you know, price kind of fluctuates depending on uh, the, pr the the price of Bitcoin because they're also used for for mining. Uh, but these things are ridiculously powerful, and they do this parallel processing that we mentioned that allows them to do a ridiculous number of computations per second. And you can see this in the the, the uh, influence and penetration of GPU. If you look at so this is a a uh, basically a competition for um, for the ability to recognize to, to uh, natural image recognition, and what you see here is the number of uh, entries that are using GPU since 2012 is steadily rising, and the error rate steadily goes decline. Right, so this I know correlation does not equal causation, but yes, it does. Uh, that's what's going on. Right, and and just a ridiculous amount of data. Right, as we mentioned, so these, these 83 exabytes, that's 2016, I'm sure it's up since, since then. Uh, the number of, how much is an exabyte? Anybody? Good it's a lot, <laughs> okay? <laughs> an absurd amount of data uh, is sort of flowing through the, the, you know, every day is being transmitted over the internet, far more than we can store. Uh, we just, can, we wouldn't be able to, we, there, there's not enough storage capacity to really capture probably even a single day's worth of traffic. Uh, and, and so the amount of data that's flowing is just, uh, really beyond comprehension, it's, it's, and it allows you to go and sit, you know, the kind of exercises we're going to do in this course, you can go and say, you know what, I want to build a, uh, you know, a, uh, a banana classifier, something we did in class uh, this past semester. I want to see whether it's a ripe banana or not ripe banana. So can you find me hundreds of images or thousands of images of ripe bananas? Yes, you can. Why do people take pictures of ripe bananas? I don't know, but they do, and they <laughs> post it to the internet. And it's to the, to the you know gift to to science uh, that people go and post all these things. <laughs> and then there's this open source ethos, which I think may be almost as important. And it's this idea that uh, and that taking your your uh, research and taking your innovation and squirreling it away and not sharing it is just not cool anymore. That's not how you make it. What you do is you post it on your GitHub, uh, and then somebody can download it. 
pull up TensorFlow, which unlike powerful programming, uh, some, some, some powerful programming packages in the past, things like MATLAB, for example, is free. Uh, and you can go on Collaboratory. Using TensorFlow Collaboratory is put out by Google. Again, a free product. There's a lot of free stuff out there that, as I said, democratizes this. And people share their code. The most valuable, some of the most valuable code, uh, you know, stuff that just, that the government, you know, 15 years ago, if you had shown it to them, they would have been like, okay, come with us, right? This is just too powerful. We have to put this in a warhead, which they did, by the way. Uh, they surely did put a lot of this technology in warheads. Uh, but by now, by now, this technology is free for, uh, you know, a 12 or 13 year old who wants to go and get involved in this can go and find this information. Now, this not only democratizes this stuff, it also accelerates development, right? If you can build something that does something useful and people find out about it, you've changed the field. Right? You've been able, you don't even necessarily have to publish it. You don't necessarily have to uh, you know, uh, disseminate it through any of the typical channels. You just put it on your GitHub. And if people find out about it, it could just, over, you know, it could change the, the, the field overnight. Okay, and so this brings the deep artificial neural networks. Uh, this is sort of the big deal. Uh, these deep artificial neural networks, again, they're simulations of the brain. Well, we're gonna talk a little conceptually about uh, what these, uh, how, basically how these work. But before we do that, I just wanna, do a quick step back and talk about why AI was hard. You know, what are, what's with Claude Shannon and, and Turing? Well, how come they couldn't do it? I mean, were they stupid? And uh, you know, the answer is no. These were the smartest people probably walking the planet, um, and they were not able to build Rosie, right? And thankfully, we haven't seen the evil Decepticons taking over, right? Depends on who you who you ask, right? Uh, which one of these is going to get here first? If we're going to have a, a happy helpful robots, or we're gonna have the evil destroying robots. We're not gonna talk about, that's not what we're here to discuss. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that we don't have either of these uh, quite yet, still. All right, so the reality of AI is something a little bit closer. That's loud. How do you lower the volume? There we go. We don't need volume at all. So this is Asimo <laughs> taking a little spill. And my favorite part is where they, uh, they're ready for it because they have these panels. Come on, where is it? Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing to see here, right? They're like, oh, move along. Uh, so, you know, they're, and they know that it's, it's gonna fall. Stair climbing's still hard, right? Stair climbing's not hard for people, right? You learn to climb stairs, what, two, three years old. It's actually a very challenging problem. I don't know if Boston Dynamics, I still haven't seen stair climbing. Right? They people have, have no. They have it? It's bought many. Okay. So, They've got it now, right? But it took a long time. So why, why did it take so long? Um, why, why is AI difficult? Uh, so there's something called Moravec Paradox, which was the observation that the things that humans tend to find kind of easy to do, like walking around and not knocking into stuff, going up downstairs, language processing, right? Just listening to me talk feels very effortless. You don't have to sit there, you don't have to get out your pen and paper and try to calculate, uh, you know, what are the probabilities of these words appearing in conjunction with those words, you don't have to do any of that. It just, it just, you just go. Well, if we talk about uh, machine ability, uh, when it, when it, uh, on, uh, do I have my skills here? I think I'm in this, uh, yeah, not quite right. Um, but if you talk about machine ability in, uh, in these uh, fields, there's just kind of an, an inverse relationship. Uh, so machines are not good at, they're still not good at natural language processing. They can understand text, but uh, the things that we find easy in this case, or visual recognition, uh, there's there's still not a human capability. Again, we open up our eyes and we see. Uh, it's, so our brain. The reason why this is the case is because the our brains are built to do these kinds of things. It's it's really a, it's not the kind of uh, serial uh, kind of computation that AI consisted of for a long time. Instead, it's this massively parallel kind of distributed processing that's good at doing these kinds of tasks, uh, and that that people are really good at because our brains are built to do them. Uh, and we're not as good at things like, you know, complex calculations. Uh, so doing a nine trillion, you go ahead and do nine trillion, uh, you know, math calculations, right? Even really simple ones. Okay, well, Russ is really good. But, you know, most of us would take, you know, many thousands of lifetimes to do that. Uh, so we are not very good at doing these uh, very rapid but simple calculations, uh, but machines are. Uh, so it turns out, you know, if you look at, People, it's not actually really that easy to do visual recognition. I don't know how many people have seen this, but uh, this is a phenomenon called inattentional blindness, which should make us a little more humble that 
we humans are also not, uh, we also require a lot of processing power in order to do uh, the kinds of co computations that we do. So here is a study where this guy is the uh, subject of the experiment. And this guy is actually the experimenter. He's asking him directions. Right, and he swaps out. So it's a different guy. And uh, you know, more than half the time, people don't notice. If you ask him, well, did you notice anything strange happen? So you know, it's not at, the reason why it's, it seems easy to do recognition is because our brains are really good at figuring out what information is important in the environment and devoting actually massive computational resources to solving that problem. So uh, if we're not devoting those resources, if we're spending time doing something else, like giving directions, by the way, I actually was a completely different person <laughs> than the person who started off this whole lecture. <laughs> that would be cool. Uh, so if we devote our resources elsewhere, we, we fail. That's called attention, right? No, so it's computational resources. We really are uh, running supercomputers in, in our heads. Um, OK. So why is it so hard? So one way to think about it is that it's really, there's a ridiculously large space of possible images that we can encounter. If we think about a really a simple binary image where you could just have a black or white in each pixel, how many possible images can you create out of, say, of something like this? Well, the answer is two to the n, two to the n, where n is the number of pixels, right? So if you're talking about a hundred pixel image, it's two to the hundred. That's a really, really, really big number, right? If you're talking about a, a, a more standard size image, you know, 1080, uh, then you're talking about a number that's almost, it may as well be infinite. It means that one way to think about this is you'll never see the same image twice. Uh, if you just shuffle uh, the, the black and whites uh, here, uh, you, and for, for a reasonably large image, uh, the number of possible images explodes very, very quickly. And if you think about grayscale, which is 256 possible values for each uh, little dot, then it's 256 to the number of pixels. And if you think about an HD image, that's 256 for each RGB value. So that's 256 to the third, because you can get each combination of those 256, and then that number to the, uh, this number here, based on, that's the number, I just calculated the number of pixels in an HD image. So we're talking about numbers that are well beyond, I think, the, the number of particles in the universe. So what this means is that you simply can't write down an instruction for every image beforehand. You cannot possibly anticipate, in the real world, you cannot anticipate what images you're going to uh, going to encounter. That's different from even a game like chess, where there was early, you know, a lot of early successes, 1980s, 1990s. There were chess uh, playing programs that could beat uh, the world champion, and that's because uh, they could those those chess games could actually think through those chess playing computers could actually think through a large number of the possible states uh, that the chessboard could undergo, and could go through those and say, well, if I do this, then this, and this, and this. But you can't think through all the possible images. It's not, it's not actually physically, computationally possible. Uh, so the, the problem in some sense is just too big, is that there's too many possible states. So you know, if you look at just at, at regular uh, vision, so these are all houses. You've never seen any of these before, but you know they're houses. You've, you can tell this is the same guy, but the images are all different from one another. So somehow we're learning some sort of equivalence across radically different images. Uh, and they're, again, as we said, there's just an, an far too many possible images to anticipate beforehand. So in other words, what you can't do is say beforehand, I'm going to write down every possible state of the sensory system and come up with a, a response to that. That's never going to work. So what are the solutions? Well, a couple of really important uh, ideas are, one is that we can learn features, that the space of, of possible images is ridiculously large. But the number of actual images within that space is much smaller. What we mean is that there's a lot of structure in the world, right? So there isn't just white noise. It's not like pixels are random. And there's something we'll talk about more on the third day, not tomorrow, but the next day, is that there's a lot of say, self-similarity, right? If you take two arbitrary pixels from two arbitrary measurements from two locations uh, uh, in, in close proximity to one another, they're going to be very similar in the natural world. So you have lots of structure. And so one thing to do is to design your computer program to take advantage of this structure. And that can reduce the dimensionality. What we can do is not ask, what's the pixel value here and what's the pixel value here, but ask, is there one of these or one of these? 
right? That's a much smaller set of questions that you can ask that can reduce the problem space. And these are just a little uh, pre uh, preview of the kinds of features that machine learning actually can converge on. These are the kinds of things that show up in, uh, in the actual physical universe all the time. Another important solution is modeling in order to predict unobserved examples of something. So no, we cannot sample all the images in the world and say, now we've got it. I know what all cats, possible cats look like. And so when we encounter one, I just have to go to my lookup table and, oh, here it is, cat number 3,257,000, right? That's not going to work. What you have to do is learn a bunch of cats and then generalize to a new one, or learn a bunch of examples of anything and generalize to a new one. And so that's where models come in. So what's the idea of a model is some sort of way of form of a mathematically defined object that's able to take in any input and produce some output from that. So you don't have to observe all the examples. It's a way of generalizing. So these are, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna walk through some very simple examples of things you're all very, probably intermittently familiar with, things like regression. Um, so what's the idea of classification, regression? These are both really important uh, problems in supervised learning where you give train, training examples to a model and it has to produce uh, some sort of prediction. Well, basically what you do is, uh, you're, what you're trying to do is learn from a bunch of examples and then be able to take a guess, make an inference as we call it, uh, on a new example. So for example, regression, let's say you've got a bunch of X values and Y values. What could this be? Well, this could be height and weight. Um, it could be number of years in school and salary. It could be whatever, right? What is it really? Just some dots I put on here. It's not real data. Anyway, so we see some relationship here, right? It looks kind of like there's, there's a relationship. Uh, what, now, we want to guess some new value, right? At this value, this height, or at this number of years of schooling, what's going to be the why? That's the question. We haven't observed it, but we have to make an inference. And so what do we do? Anybody? We do a regression, linear regression, right? We, we make some sort of best fit line. So what is a best fit line? Well, it's a way of really, really, really dumbing down uh, the data in some ways. It's saying we're going to throw away a lot of the complexity of the data, and we're going to make a simple model, in this case, an incredibly simple model that has two of these uh, parameters. So there's just two settings on your model that you have to set, and then that can make a prediction. Now we've got our predictions for any, for any arbitrary x, right? Give me any weight. I'll give you the height. Now, will it be right to some approximation? It will also be wrong to some approximation. That's because there's inherent noise relative to this particular model. This model does not capture all of the complexity. But it might do so sufficiently that it's good enough for this particular purpose. So these parameters, this idea of a parameter is a very important one. Parameters are the changeable parts of your model. So for any model, which is you know can be far more complex than this, there might be some number of uh, of these knobs, you can think of them almost like knobs, that you can adjust uh, in order to change the model, right? So what's the two things you can change on a linear regression line? Slope, slope, slope and the intercept, right? So those are basically it. That's, you're not going to do better than that. There's nothing else you can do with this, this particular model in order to better fit your data. Classification, similarly, we may see a bunch of examples of one class. So whatever, I don't know what these are meant to represent. You can come up with whatever you want. Uh, but let's say we've observed that these are examples of, uh, you know, class uh, J, and these are examples of class I, and now we want to know what's the name of this. Is it belong to this class or that class? Same idea. Come up with, again, a linear model, linear classifier, uh, and what this does, in this case, the linear classifier is now we could say, well, if it's below the line, we'll call it a member of this, and if it's above the line, we'll call it a member of that. And again, we'll get it right all the time, no, it won't, but to some degree of approximation, this particular model for some purposes might be sufficient. And of course, you can extend this to higher dimensions, right? Uh, even a linear classifier can, can take in multiple dimensions. So you can have uh, something that's a function of two dimensions, right? Here we have this x, y, and then we have the z. Uh, so let's say we're trying to predict the height, uh, you know, trying to predict some particular value of one of these points here based on these two uh, values. And so the same idea, so that we, this is a hyperplane. It's more obvious why it's a plane. A line is also considered a hyperplane. But this is something that, in this case, it's, it's a linear divider that separates uh, some observed data. In, and the purpose is to make some prediction about some unobserved data point. And if we think about you know, real world problems, like cats and dogs, can we think about these in the same way? And the answer is, you can. 
uh, what we can see, each image is a, hyper, is a point in a hyperdimensional space. What does that, what does that mean? It's, it's a fancy way of saying that if you want to write down, if you want to actually, let's say, communicate an image uh, to somebody else, one way to do that is to literally write, you know, you get out, uh, you know, open up your, uh, you know, your graphing paper and you put in, uh, write down each RGB value at every single point. And how many numbers do you have to write down? That's the, that's the dimensionality of your, of your input. And so these are very high dimensional. Instead of you know, one uh, or two or three dimensions, in this case, it's as many dimensions as there are pixels. And each image, as you say, is a point in that space. So you can imagine something similar to the, well, you can't imagine it, right? You can pretend to imagine it. You can't imagine more than three dimensions because our brains don't work that way. Uh, but the idea would be for every single uh, dimension, there's, uh, that specifies an address. And for that address, each image has a particular value uh, at that address. So it, that, that image represents a certain point in that space. OK, so it might seem simple. OK, well, then great, right? We can just uh, do the hyperplane thing, right? Well, no, they're, these, they, they're past the number of parameters you'd have to set is the problem, right? So it's, this is easy. OK, no big deal here. We can just play with these two parameters, and that does a pretty good job. But if you're dealing with you have to bend this line, not just this way and that way, but you have to bend it this way and that way. In every single, in every dimensional direction, you have to be able to fix the line. It becomes a very, very difficult problem. So for a long time, people tried to design models and features that they thought were reasonable. Maybe they were based on the brain. Maybe they were based on some computational intuition. Um, and there was some success, but we like to call it the ladder to the moon. We would see incremental progress, uh, but the progress was such that you could wait many lifetimes until you would actually get to computer vision. That was something you'd get into the car seat and sit back and read a book and let it drive for you. That's not where things were, gonna really, gonna, were really going um, because the, the progress was too incremental. So machine learning is in a different approach. Instead of a human based, uh, humans designing the model and the features, uh, instead the machine learns it, right? Who programs the programmer, right? Uh, our brains do not get programmed. Instead, they self-program based on our experience. So what is machine learning in a nutshell? I think one way, the simplest way to think of it is there's just basically two steps uh, to what machine learning consists of. There has to be a way, you have a model, it may start off random, it may start off, you may have some sort of tuning that you do in the first place. You know, think about a regression model. Well, you could just pick random variable, var random parameter settings. And then you have to have a way of assessing the model's performance. So there has to be this training data. At least in the case of supervised learning, we have training data to see how well does it do? How well does it do in producing the correct outputs? And then there has to be a way to change the model parameters. Assess performance, change model parameters, assess it again, change them again. Do this rinse and repeat a lot of times, especially for very large models, just enormous computational powers involved. You have to change all these settings and then decide what to do based on the model performance. Changing model parameters, you could do this randomly, but you'll never get there for a model of any uh, real complexity. There, the, some of the big breakthroughs, as I mentioned, is knowing how, what direction to change those model parameters in. And that's something that uh, William's going to talk about in some more detail. So just come back to the, our, uh, the example of, of regression. Um, so one way to think about this is, from a machine learning standpoint, would be that you'd set your parameters uh, with a certain weight. In fact, you know what? Let me do this demo if that runs. So here, I'm going to make you some, make some data points. <laughs> Isn't science fun? Uh, All right. And then we're going to do some. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to set our regression line. Let me show these. So I'm going to make a, a regression line. And you can see what I'm doing here. Here I'm changing slope, intercept. Cool. And here is our <laughs> error. Probably somebody likes it. Right? Here's our error fun. Here's our error. Here's a loss or error or cost depending on your terminology. And what we want to do is minimize that. So we're going to try to find a better fit to the point where we minimize the loss as well as we can. So we have a way of, so here I'm sort of in the, I could do it, I could spend a lot of time on this, but uh, I won't. Uh, so, you know, that's maybe close to the best fit. And so we could do this iteratively. You could pick some parameters, you can measure the loss, and then you adjust your model accordingly. And hopefully, you know, we can see it visually, we kind of have an intuition of how to change it. But your computer program might not have that intuition. You have to tell it how 
to decide which way to change. You could just do it randomly, but that would take an awful long time. You might want, you want a more sensible way of deciding how we can change the model uh, in order to better to reduce the loss. So that's the point. The goal is to choose values of m and b, or in other words, choose values of the parameters that reduces this residual error in this case, how far off it is from the, the, uh, the observed values. Now, these are, one way to think about it, these are the training data. These are the cases where we know the outcome and we train the model on that. How do we really test the model? Well, we want to throw it some curveballs that it hasn't seen. And let's see how well it does, right? We might want to throw in some that we were holding out on. So this is the, the basic process of machine learning. What we do is, well, first we pre-process the data. We'll get to that. We usually want to, we, we want to help the, the machine learning algorithm by getting the, the data into such a form that makes it easier for it to be able to come up with solutions. We'll talk about that about a bit more over the next few days. Uh, but the real magic happens when you train and validate. So training on examples that you give the model access to. So for example, in the regression model, you're telling it for this value of x, this value of y, make me a model that does the best job of actually producing those inputs and outputs. And then you test it uh, with a validation set. You hold some back. Uh, so you typically can hold back a certain amount of validation data where you know the answer, but the model doesn't. And then you ask it and see whether it's able to do a good job on that. One of the important reasons you need validation data is you want to prevent this thing called overfitting. You don't want your model to become so specific to your particular data that it does a very bad job of generalizing. For example, if you have, uh, it's actually interesting, um, uh, this, this, there's a source of concern uh, in the machine learning community that if you can tamper with a training data set, you can sabotage machine learning. For example, let's say I'm training a data set to recognize stop signs. And every single version of stop signs, let's say I sneak in uh, you know, a couple of little green pixels somewhere that you can barely see. Maybe a human wouldn't even notice it. Well, if that happens to be per perfectly predictive of stop signs, right? every single image of a stop sign has those little green pixels, the computer program is going to seize on that and learn that. It's going to learn those particular features because they're perfectly predictive. And therefore, let's say you get on, now you go deploy it in the real world. Well, all you have to do is uh, perhaps uh, you know, encounter an example of stop signs that don't have those green pixels. Or alternatively, you know, somehow, if you can sneak in some, some you know, spray paint some green uh, onto you know, some sign that it's not supposed to recognize as a stop sign, it can mistake that. Uh, so this is an example of, of overfitting. When you learn the specifics of the training data, then your algorithm could, can overfit and it can fail to generalize. So you want to have validation data which is data that the, the model doesn't see, at least in each iteration of the model. Again, these are, uh, you're, going to, you're going to see details of this uh, as we actually walk through some examples. And so what you want is to make sure that your model can generalize to unseen pairs of data. Validation, and there's also test data. Uh, you don't always necessarily do this, but there's validation is what happens during training. You hold some back. You, t you see how well do you do. You, you train on some pairs, train on some uh, on supervised data check the validation performance. And if it's not doing so well in validation, let's keep going. Uh, and then when you're done, you might want yet another uh, example of data that it's never seen, not even for validation. Because even the validation, in some ways, the model is optimizing to do well on that validation data. What you really want, if you, especially if you're dealing with real world life, you know, serious consequence kind of uh, applications, you want to see that it generalizes to completely unseen data. So for example, uh, this is an example I think we're going to see again. Uh, let's say you want to train a, you know, Zillow. Uh, it's taking in a bunch of data as inputs. It's taking in things like, uh, it's trying to guess the size of uh, the price of a house. So take some historical data in. Uh, it might take in things, these are various different dimensions you can measure. Uh, size of house, distance from the city, age of the house, again, totally made up data. Um, but what you want to do is train on a bunch of these. You could just do, in this case, you might do a regression. Uh, and you try to predict uh, these values here. You train your model on these examples, and then you give it a validation that it hasn't seen before. It's never seen this particular combination, but you know the answer, right? We have the historical data. We want to see does the, and I don't really, you don't really just do one. You do a, a set. Something usually off some 80 20 rule, sometimes people use. You train on 80% of the data you got, you hold off, keep 20% for validation. 
and then you test to see whether uh, it's able to correctly guess the, the, the price that you, you actually know is correct. OK, so we're here to talk about, yes, question. Do you have to decide in advance what algorithm it's going to use, but it's a regression? Because can the deep learning uh, make decisions about algorithm modification? That's a very good question. Um, so something we, we haven't discussed is this, this idea of hyperparameters. So the mod, typically, uh, no. Typically, you decide, this is my model. It has this many neurons. Uh, it has this learning rate. It has uh, you know, uh, this particular loss function. And that's fixed. Yeah. And then you, let it, then you let it go. And you give it, a, you give it a run. And if things go well, great. If not, you might start to play with those things. You might, you might want to change some of those things. But you typically don't do that during training. Uh, so there's, there's this whole uh, kind of frontier of so-called hyperparameters. So it's, these are not the parameters that are learned during uh, during the actual training, but these are things that are set by the human operator. Um, and there are many of them. And as you can imagine, once again, you get into a combinatorial explosion if you're talking about optimization. What's the right number of neurons? What's the right learning rate? What's, what's the right loss function for this particular problem? And, and for one problem, it's going to be different. It depends very much on the, the, on the statistical structure of your data. Where is the information? And so this is a, a next frontier. Can we build meta models that at the same time as they learn uh, and, and tune, hyper, tune parameters, can we also get models that are walking through hyperparameter space as well? This is a concern of people like myself and others that this might be a sort of a bright line between people who have access to absurd computing power, like Google, versus the rest of us schmucks, right? Who just are like running, yeah, we got our 1080s, we got five of them, right? Well, you, you know, they have. 20 DGX2s, and those things you know, can go through as many models as we can go through in a day, they can go through in a minute. And so they can possibly start to do that kind of work. Did you have a, was there a well, question? I, maybe we can do this later, but I'm troubled by the green pixel business. Let's say the thing's picking up stop signs. You don't know how it's, it's recognizing stop signs. The back of a sign, if it's doing it because it's octagonal, uh, when it sees the back of a stop sign, which really isn't a stop sign, as far as it's concerned, is it going to say it's a stop sign? So this is why you need a lot of so. So what's the answer to uh, how do you deal with the potential for this overfitting? And the answer is you need a really large, diverse set of, of training stimuli. So that if there's really what it's going to come down to, all of this comes down to, uh, is finding those features that are predictive of your class across very wide variability. And so the back of a stop sign is probably not going to have those features that are going to be because we're talking about stop signs across many different examples and different lighting under, very di under different conditions. What is common across them? The hope would be that what's common across them is not going to generalize to, to that particular example. Yeah. So it really comes down, you know, and, and this, there's an old adage in, uh, in, in computer science, garbage in, garbage out, right? And so in some ways, the most valuable resource is not even computing power anymore, but training data. Who has access to the best training data? Because it really all depends on that. I mean, so a lot of these models, of course, there are differences in the way they perform. Uh, of course, there's, there's, there is a whole art to this, uh, to this science, uh, deciding you know, hyperparameter tuning and which model to use and all that. But your data uh, and, the, uh, and having a lot of data uh, that has the kind of variability that's going to be important is really critical. So let's, let's talk a little bit about neural networks. So as the name implies, they're neural networks. Uh, they're all based on, to some extent, inspired by the brain. And inspired by the brain, why? Because, again, we, this was the only, re, the only way we could possibly imagine that there could be a computer that would able to, be able to differentiate across lots of different images that are, are incredibly dissimilar, like those how, pictures of houses. Why would we think it would even be possible for a computer to do that? Well, it's because we can do it. Right? So this is, the, of course, the inspiration for the entire idea of being able to do these hard problems was the fact that humans could do it. And so at, at, from the outset, uh, people who were interested in solving the problem of, uh, of general artificial intelligence were looking for inspiration to the brain. So let's talk really, you know, this is a five-minute uh, introduction to, uh, to, the, to neuroscience. Uh, so you're probably all from basically familiar with the idea of central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. So one way to think about that is we have an input and output. 
uh, and then we have a processor in between. And so the inputs are, of course, the sensory data, right? It's your, your five senses or more uh, that are measuring some conditions in the environment. At the simplest level, we can think of images on the retina. Right? They're photoreceptors that are measuring the, the values of different light on, from different uh, locations in the image, uh, in, the, in the environment. And then we have some sort of processor, central processor. I don't know if it's a GPU or a CPU, but we've got a brain. And that does something to process that and come up with an output, come up with a behavioral output. And so in some ways, uh, we really can think of the, the, the problems are, are largely similar. We're, we're taking in information. Uh, it's digitized information in the form of, uh, in, the, in the case of computer science. It's a big debate whether the, the brain is sort of analog or digital. We won't get into that. Uh, but in any case, we take in the data, we crunch the numbers, and then we produce some output. And the way this happens is there are these interconnected neurons. So these are specialized cells. Uh, they're, they're cells just like any other cells. They have all the mitochondria and all that other good stuff, and they have to stay alive. But they also do this funny thing where they can send messages to each other through this action potential that's, that's uh, an electrical conductance that goes down this axon. And then it goes to the receiving neuron that has the dendritic uh, connections here. These dendrites receive information in the form of neurotransmitter release. So actually, neurons don't really touch. There's a synaptic cleft. Uh, where these neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft. And then what happens is one neuron releases neurotransmitters and that's received by the receiving neuron. Um, why do we have this weird neuro, uh, why do we have this weird sort of electrochemical kind of system? Well, electricity is fast, so you want to conduct information from your toe to your brain, or maybe you don't, right? If you stub your toe, sometimes it's just that moment, you're like, ah, oh, here it comes, right? So <laughs> you don't want it to be too fast, but it, it's coming. And so you want that information to get sent, uh, you know, actually as, as quickly as possible if you have to make a quick action uh, in response to it. But on the other hand, then we have this weird chemical thing that happens here. The, the, the best understanding we have of why there is this kind of chemical system is because it's easy to make changes here. You can make changes in things like how many receptors you have for these neuro, for these chemicals. Or you can change the conditions in the, uh, in the environment in the synaptic cleft such that these neurotransmitters get uh, dissolves faster or slower. These are changes that your brain can make, uh, sometimes, maybe perhaps in a matter of seconds, uh, that can lead to uh, permanent changes in our brain. Why do we want permanent changes in our brain? We can learn so it. we can learn, right? That's what learning is. Uh, so that's basically, the, so the brain is a learning machine. The whole purpose of the brain is to change, right? Unlike other organs, of course they grow, but their function remains fairly static. You want it to remain static. You, want, you don't want your heart to start changing the way it functions. Uh, you maybe want it to modify its behavior based on certain conditions, but you want it to basically be constant. But your brain, you want it to change, right? You've got to learn French or English or German, whatever language you're born into. Uh, and you want to learn how to get around the environment, how to move your body. All of these things need to be learned. Uh, so what happens after the neurotransmitter is this thing called an action potential, which is this all or none response of electrical conductance down the axon. And it's a non-linearity which turns out to be very, it's a very important function, feature of the way uh, the brain does its business, it turns out to be extremely important in the way you build artificial neural networks. You've got to put this nonlinearity in there, and we'll see a little bit, I think William's going to talk a little bit about why nonlinearities are very important. So it's nonlinear in the sense that what you do is you have these uh, impinging neurons that are sending, here, let's, so th this is an action potential, right? It's, you've got stimulus, it's, uh, and then all of a sudden you get this big uh, depolarization and then refractory period where it has to recover, and then it can do this a bunch of times. These are called neuronal spikes. Uh, so you get boop, 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 well, much faster than that. You can have many per second uh, of the neuron. And uh, what's going on is you have other neurons that are sending through their uh, neurotransmitter release and impinging on the dend dendrite of the receiving neuron. You have different kinds of, uh, uh, really two flavors of what they can do. They can excite and inhibit, right? You can, they can release neurotransmitters that make the receiving neuron more or less likely to fire. Um, and it's nonlinear in the sense that, and I think Dr. Brussler mentioned yesterday, that this, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's not just, you don't, this thing is not just adding together the uh, inhibitory or a bunch of excitatory or a bunch of inhibitory and just giving you the sum. In, in this case, it's a threshold. It has to reach a certain threshold of excitement in order to fire. And so one way to think about this is it's really looking for a particular level of excited excitation and anything less than that it's not going to respond 
something that shows up in the nonlinearities that are built into artificial neural, ne artificial neural networks. Um, in fact, the most popular one was a re a RELU, the Rectified linear, linear Unit, is basically doing this. It's flat up to a certain point, and then it can go, uh, well, for negative, and then it goes positive when, when it's excitatory. Okay, so uh, here I've built a, a very simple little example of a neural circuit made up of excitatory and inhibitory, just to sort of get a, a feel for how you can build something that's really simple, that's doing uh, something we can call feature detection. And remember, I mentioned earlier, right, this is the whole, this is kind of the goal of the system, is to find those features that are predictive of a certain class. And it's a way of reducing the dimensionality. You don't want to actually measure the photoreceptor response, 100 million photoreceptors per eye. And there's just an, an infinite number of ways those can be activated. What you really want to look for are certain features that occur across specific examples, like going back to the stop sign. So what we have here is excitatory connections here, inhibitory connections here. Now we're shining a light and it's stimulating a receptor, this just this receptor. Okay, that, that produces this level of response. And then if we extend the light out here, it produces this level of response because now it's hitting these and there's an excitatory. And then we go out here and it starts to go down again. Right, so it's a very, this is very nonlinear. This neuron is not just responding linearly to the amount of light that's in the environment. It's producing a nonlinear response. As it goes further, it goes down. So what we have here is sort of a peak excitation for a particular level of, so we could call this a feature detector. And this is a term that actually is used frequently in the neuroscience literature. What does this neuron like? Well, it likes bars of light of this particular size. And it's the gold, sort of the Goldilocks uh, feature, right? Not too big, not too small, just right. And that's the feature that it responds to. And we can imagine doing this in a nonlinear way, in, in, in a way that doesn't look like this. So these lines imply that it's responding uh, basically to all of these different features. But what we could do is flatten this out and make this, it doesn't respond at all unless, I guess I didn't draw that right. This should be down to zero. But it, should, it doesn't respond at all unless that feature is present. And that would be an extreme nonlinearity, right? It's does it, it just has a response to a particular uh, feature. And in fact, we find exactly these kinds of stimuli uh, exactly these kinds of neurons. So Hubel and Weasel uh, received the Nobel Prize for finding neurons that are in the cat visual cortex. And we can actually listen to one of these neurons. Now, you can't really hear a neuron, obviously. Otherwise, it'd be really hard to sneak up on people. But uh, if you put, if you transduce inf the information of, a, of, of an action potential into, into a sound, you can sort of hear what these sound like. I'm going to speed it up as well. Um, let me see if we get some sound. Maybe there. So this is a simple cortical cell. There's the sound. Oh, I turned it off. That was clever of me. Each pop you're hearing is actually the response of a single neuron being recorded in a cat's uh, early visual cortex. And what you can see is it's silent there, silent there, but then when it the responds to the offset there. Yes. That's the inhibitory region. Much better said. Right, so there's an excitatory inhibitory. I don't want to get into too much nitty gritty, but I think the real point is, you know, let's uh, zoom in over here. You can see that it's, it, it doesn't respond there, right? No noise. And then when it crosses this particular location, it responds. It also doesn't respond there, right? No, there's no, no sound. Why not? Well, because it's looking for a particular feature. Again, it's nonlinearity. It's not just increasing its response in relation to increase in some specific uh, environmental stimulus. It doesn't map like that. It maps in this very nonlinear way. It's looking for a particular feature. And so that, in a nutshell, is what uh, we think the brain is kind of doing. Uh, it's basically, one way to think about what the brain is, is it's a big game of 20 questions. It's, your brain is consistently asking what features are present and which combinations of features are present, right? Is it bigger than a, a bread box? Uh, is it alive? Is it, does it, you know, can you keep it as a pet? Well, these are each individual questions, and your brain is sort of asking those questions. Is it have, does it have this orientation? Is it in conjunction with something else that has a different orientation? If you combine those sufficiently to, to a sufficiently complex degree, then what you get is uh, the answer to a question of, is there a stop sign? Uh, that's, that's, in some ways, uh, the whole thing. And then, of course, the devil's in the details. Okay, so, and I'm almost done here uh, because I'm heading into 
uh, kind of sort of the next talk's uh, terrain. So artificial neural networks are a way of kind of dumbing down, getting rid of a lot of the physiology and biochemistry and all that stuff, and basically treating the problem as one of summation and nonlinearity. You have units. It could be input units like these. These could represent whatever your input dimensions that you want to measure are. They could be luminance values in a, in a photograph. They could be stock numbers from the past, uh, you know, a bunch of, from a bunch of indices uh, yesterday. And what you're trying to produce is some output that is what you want to know about the data. Is it a dog or a cat? Is my stock going to go up or down, right? Should I sell or not? Is, it, is this CAT scan cancer or not? These are the kinds of questions you can ask. And then the whole game is to change these weights. So we can think of these as sort of dendritic connections. And the dendritic connections can be modified. How much does this input weigh in to this, uh, su this summation and then a nonlinearity in terms of changing this output here? These can be negative and these can be positive, just like neurons can be excitatory and inhibitory. Or they could be zeroed out. Maybe it doesn't matter. Right? Let's say you were trying to pick stocks and there's you know, the question of what was the weather in you know, Honolulu today. It doesn't matter. So maybe that matters for predicting the weather, but it doesn't predict, matter for predicting stocks. You can basically you'd want to change the weight so that you throw away that information. And then again, so you, you kind of sum, and then you have some nonlinear activation function. We're going to explore a couple of those different possibilities. Again, it's, some of it is an art form. Why do you use an ARIA, you know, a RELU versus a sigmoid? Uh, some of it, in some cases, is, is pretty well grounded, uh, but this is sort of where the frontier is. And so, you know, going back to our regression case, well, you can actually build uh, a, a simple neural network. You wouldn't really want to because there's closed form ways of, uh, of doing your regression and actually finding your best fit line. But if you really wanted to, you could do just that. You could make one weight represents your slope, another weight represents your bias, and then you just feed in all of the known inputs and observe the outputs, and then you want to somehow change these weights so that you get back to your best fit line. How do you do that? Well, you can measure the error, and then you have to have some technique for changing these weights. You'll hear a lot more about that next, about what the technique is for changing the weights. For simple, a simple neural network like this, you might be able to do that with a pretty simple algorithm to figure out how to change these weights. But of course, when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of these parameters, it becomes a very tricky question indeed. It's not uh, as simple as just defining these, uh, these two parameters. So it's the same idea, nonlinearity, summation, and then, uh, in fact, in a lot of neural networks, you do have exactly this. You have uh, something that represents, uh, that represents an input. That th this, multipli this is a multiplier of the input. And then you have something called a bias, which pretty much, it's very, very similar uh, to, uh, to, to the, to the y-intercept. It's something that's constant. It's not dependent on the values of the input. It's just some fixed amount that you might shift over your function. Um, so in a, in, a, in a nutshell, that uh, really brings us back to, uh, to the simplest idea of what a model is. And so they get very complicated, right? And so you build uh, lots of neurons, right? lots of inputs. This can be very high dimensional data. And you can have multiple layers. And this is what's possible now that wasn't really possible before. Uh, because of the number of parameters. This, is, this may look complicated, but this is nothing compared to the real neural net, deep neural networks you build. And you can learn increasingly complex features of the input. So you might want to learn things like when this, is, oh, a certain this has a certain value and this has a certain value. Uh, let's see, these are both excited, but you don't want this to be excited. Or maybe you want these three to be excited, but not this one. Right? These are very complex features of the input. Again, going back to like our little line example, you want it to be these ones to be uh, you want the, these neurons to be excited, but not these ones out here. And so we could think of what the brain is doing is trying to set these weights so that it becomes responsive to these specific features. And the features, what features are going to become responsive to? Well, it's all going to depend on the ones that are predictive of whatever it is you're trying to train the model to do. If you want it to recognize cats and dogs, well, it's going to somehow measure how well it's doing and it's going to change the weights accordingly. Eventually, it's going to converge on features that are predictive of cats and dogs, or stop signs versus non-stop signs. So that, in, 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 sort of in a nutshell, is, is the name of the game currently. Of course, as I said, there's a lot of details uh, to be uh, discovered. Uh, so I don't know if William's here. Are we going straight into? Uh... 
I, I can't imagine you guys don't need like at least five minutes to, to breathe. Uh, I guess he's not here. So, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I think that's about all I have to say today. Um, and so just as a quick preview, tomorrow we're going to start talking about uh, some of the particular sort of best in class approaches to how you build these kind of artificial neural networks. Uh, there is some very important, some, some very important uh, progress has been made in a particular class. There's, you've probably heard of convolutional neural networks, which solve some of the problems of the, the ri ridiculously high dimensionality um, of uh, these kinds of deep neural network models. I'm going to, again, try to motivate a little bit um, of these idea of these convolutional neural networks based on what we know about the brain. Um, so why don't I stop and field questions? And in the meantime, maybe I should text Will and ask if he's coming up. Uh, is it, so anybody questions? And then maybe we'll take a, uh, well. Yeah, well, let, let me just so, so see if field some questions. I'm right on time. Uh, that's pretty amazing. That never happens. So have at it.